Everything from fighter jets to ICBMs, aircraft carriers, and unmanned platforms, stealth planes, special operations, and everything in between. Let us dive into the history and achievements of military technology in this episode of Mill Power. This is the emergency broadcast system. Stay tuned for an important message. The president and his key civilian and military aides have been safely evacuated to the emergency seat of government. This evening at 6.35 p.m. the enemy launched an attack against the strategic retaliatory forces of the United States and its NATO allies. In response, U.S. nuclear forces have launched a portion of our land-based missile force against the enemy's remaining strategic forces. In addition, our airborne alert and a portion of our ground alert aircraft forces have been sent against the enemy's non-missile strategic forces. Our damage assessment reports indicate that many of our nuclear bases have been destroyed or severely damaged. If you have not already found a safe location, seek fallout shelter right away. Additional missiles are being tracked with possible targets including New York, Houston, Los Angeles, Chicago, Hampton Roads, Virginia and St. Mary's, Georgia. The president will address the nation as soon as his command duties permit. This is the end of the Priority One report. Stand by for more information. This is a national emergency. Twenty-fifth of January, 1995. The red phone rings in the Oval Office. President Clinton answers. On the line is General Joseph William Ashey, Commander of North American Aerospace Defense Command, or NORAD. The news is grim. Several Russian ICBMs are inbound. Flight paths taking them over the North Pole. The President's heart drops and his mind races. How can this be? A preemptive strike? After the Soviet Union's collapse? Does Yeltsin not know this will end us both? No one wins here. Mutually assured destruction. Concluding his call with General Ashi, the president begins a process to retaliate. Confirming his ID, the launch orders are sent to the Pentagon. There, codes are authenticated and sent to launch crews in underground bunkers at Mostrom Air Force Base, Montana, Minot Air Force Base, North Dakota, and Francis E. Warren Air Force Base, Wyoming. Once the codes from the Pentagon are authenticated, the crews execute the required sequences, culminating in multiple ICBM launches. Rising from their silos, two of the most powerful weapons the United States has ever deployed the LGM-30 Minuteman III and the LGM-118 Peacekeeper ICBMs. Ascending hundreds of miles into the atmosphere, the missiles accelerate to 23 times the speed of sound at 15,000 miles per hour. Reaching the apex of their flight, the missiles release their ordnance, one warhead for each Minuteman and 10 per Peacekeeper. 
each W87 warhead, yielding the explosive power of 20 Hiroshima atomic bombs apiece, now descends to their predetermined targets. As they strike, the explosions ring out over the Russian nation throughout the night. Armageddon has arrived. Luckily for us, this never happened, yet we came terrifyingly close. On the 25th of January 1995, Norwegian and American scientists launched a Black Brandt 12 suborbital research rocket to study Aurora Borealis over Svalbard in the Arctic Circle. The rocket's high northbound trajectory took it into the corridor that would be used by Minuteman 3 ICBMs, and the rocket reached an altitude of 903 miles, similar to that of a Trident D5 sub-launched ballistic missile. Fearing a high-altitude nuclear EMP attack, Russian nuclear forces were put on high alert, and Russian President Boris Yeltsin was brought to Chiget, Russia's nuclear briefcase. This incident, known as the Black Brandt Scare, is the first and only known incident where a nuclear power has activated their nuclear briefcase, putting their heads of state in a nuclear decision. Thankfully, patience won the day, and as the rocket was heading away from Russian airspace, no missiles were launched. Had things gone truly dark, the weapons mentioned, the LGM-30 Minuteman 3 and LGM-118 Peacekeeper would have been two of the instruments of America's revenge. In today's episode of the Mill Power series, we review these implements of destruction and deterrence. Before we get into the history and achievements of America's ICBMs over the decades, we need to first look into the yields of nuclear weapons. Look at it basically as a power scale to help you understand the power of the weapons these missiles could deliver halfway around the world. We'll start with the largest conventional weapon in the United States inventory, the GBU-43 Massive Ordnance Air Blast, or MOAB, nicknamed the mother of all bombs. The weapon is so large it has to be deployed from the back of a C-130 cargo aircraft. The GPS guided munition has an explosive yield equal to 11 tons of TNT. Next stop for the conventional explosives were the explosive tests conducted during Operation Sailor Hat. Operation Sailor Hat was the US Navy testing the effect of high yield explosions on ships to test durability and how a fleet would fare under nuclear attack. Each explosive charge consisted of stacked mounds of TNT 17 feet tall, 34 feet wide, 30,674 blocks each. Explosions Bravo, Charlie, and Delta each clocked in at 500 tons of TNT, or 45 MOABs at once. Next up is the 2020 Beirut explosion. Caused by a warehouse fire and a facility storing confiscated ammonium nitrate, the explosive yield is estimated to have been around 1,000 tons or one kiloton of TNT, according to researchers at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California. This would make the blast a staggering 90 times more powerful than a MOAB. And we're just getting started. The following explosion holds the record for both the largest accidental explosion in history and the largest man-made blast prior to Trinity, the first nuclear test. The 1917 Halifax explosion caused by a collision between the French SS Mont Blanc shipping high explosives and the Norwegian SS Emo, the resulting 2.9 kiloton explosion leveled nearly all structures within a half a mile of the epicenter. That 2.9 kiloton figure puts it at 263 times that of a MOAB. Next up is the minor scale test, a truly deceptive name. Minor scale was a test to simulate the blast of a small nuclear bomb on military hardware, ranging from an F-4 Phantom to hardened ICBM launchers. 
using 4,744 tons of ANFO, a high-powered industrial explosive. The test had an explosive yield of approximately 4 kilotons of TNT, or 363 MOABs. From here, we go nuclear, and we go big. The first nuclear weapon used in warfare, codenamed Little Boy, was deployed over Hiroshima, Japan on the 6th of August 1945. Yielding a blast of 15 kilotons, the bomb reduced nearly everything within a mile of ground zero to rubble and ashes. Then there's Trinity, the first ever nuclear explosion. On the 16th of July 1945, at 5.29am, the test nuclear weapon, nicknamed the Gadget, exploded with a force of 25 kilotons equal to 2,272 MOABs, or nearly 9 Halifax explosions. The final level of scale takes us from kilotons to megatons, the true monsters of the explosive world. A 1 megaton explosion generates the energy of 1 million tons of TNT. 90,909 MOABs, 345 Halifax explosions, 67 Hiroshima's or 40 Trinity Blasts. America's steps into intercontinental ballistic missiles after World War II were slow and inconsistent, primarily due to its nuclear monopoly. Being the only nation in the world with the atomic bomb, the United States would begin development on long-range missiles in 1946 with the failed MX-774 project. From this came the Convair RTV-A2 High Rock, or High Altitude Rocket. Lessons from the High Rock would teach Convair a great deal about missile design and pioneer technologies that would be used on America's first ICBM. On the 29th of August, 1949, the U.S.'s nuclear monopoly would shatter as the USSR detonated its own nuclear weapon, RDS-1, codenamed Joe one in the U.S., prompting the United States to ramp up its nuclear program, both weapons and delivery systems. In October 1953, Trevor Gardner, Assistant Secretary of the United States Air Force for Research and Development, established the Strategic Missile Evaluation Committee, codenamed the Teapot Committee, to review strategic missiles both in the United States Air Force's inventory and potential concepts. In the committee's 10th of February 1954 report, one of the panel's many recommendations was the acceleration of ICBM technology with the aim of a deployable missile in the next decade. On the 14th of May, 1954, Vice Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force, General Thomas D. White, gave Project MX-1593, Project Atlas, the highest priority for development in the Air Force, and ordered the project to accelerate to, quote, the maximum extent that technology would allow. In response, on the 1st of July, 1954, the Air Research and Development Command established the Western Development Division under the command of then Brigadier General Bernard A. Schriever to manage the Air Force's crash program on ballistic missiles. From this came the Convair SM-65 Atlas, America's first ICBM, entering service in 1959. Carrying a single 1.4 megaton W-49 thermonuclear warhead to a range of 8,700 miles, the Atlas, though capable of its design goals, had many glaring flaws. The Atlas was a massive weapon system, weighing 255,950 pounds and standing as tall as an eight-story building. They were easy targets. Relying on liquid oxygen as an oxidizer, in the event of an attack, Atlas missiles would spend precious time sitting on the launch pad being fueled. The missiles were also stored outdoors, completely exposed to the elements. This, in turn, would result in extensive maintenance and upkeep to keep the weapons ready to go. Fun fact, 
WD-40 was originally designed for conveyor to protect the external skin of the Atlas missile. Another early US ICBM developed under the WDD was the HGM-25 Titan. Developed in parallel with the Atlas missile program, the Titan was envisioned as a safety net program should the Atlas program fail. Titan missiles went into service in 1962 and had several drawbacks. The Titan I missile, much like the Atlas, was an enormous weapon, standing almost 100 feet tall and weighing 232,000 pounds. The Titan, like the Atlas, was a liquid-fueled rocket that relied on liquid oxygen for an oxidizer. It would take a Titan 15 minutes to fuel, sitting exposed on the launch pad in the event of an attack. Though the next iteration of the missile, the Titan II, would have a storable liquid fuel, allowing it to be stored in underground silos, these missiles still required extensive maintenance and routine checks on the fuel to ensure reliability of the platform. What was needed was a new type of fuel, one that would allow a missile system to be both rapidly launched and stored in hardened underground silos. The answer to this would come in the form of the Minuteman missile and solid rocket fuels. Our arms must be mighty, ready for instant action, so that no potential aggressor may be tempted to risk his own destruction. 